Hoop season is almost here, and to break it down this week on Podcast on the Brink, Tyler Tashman of Inside the Hall is here. He stepped away from writing his feature stories to join us here on the show. Tyler, are you excited as I am that we're going to have actual basketball to talk about here in the next couple of days uh, being played in Assembly Hall? I'm very excited. It it seemed like, I mean, it didn't. I can't tell if it seemed like a long time ago or not that long ago that I was going to an assem- or empty assembly hall for the Tennessee Tech game, the first game of the season last year. It just seems like, guys, so much has changed since then. Just with the the protocols and now, so now I guess a, a full assembly hall, but just the the, the entire state of the program. So. I'm um, looking forward to getting back in assembly hall for the for the opener on Tuesday. I thought you were going to say it's it feels like so long ago that you were living in Portland without air conditioning sticking your head in the in the freezer. Well, I mean, I she's I wish it was kind of hot now, but it's like it feels like it skipped fall almost cuz it went from like 50 in Bloomington and now it's just like 30 and like 20 so I was like, man, yeah, the, this is this is uh, par for the course in this part of the country. Like, I think next week down here in in, in uh, southern Indiana, Louisville, it's going to be almost back to seventy. But the other day, it was like in the twenties. So, it's a uh, it's a crazy uh, shift in temperatures. But uh, you know, the one thing about it turning cold every year that gets me excited is we're closer uh, to basketball season actually tipping off. And for this episode. Over on the Inside the Hall uh, basketball community, uh, members.insidethehall.com, I let everyone know that we were going to preview the start of the season and ask people if there was any specific topics that they would uh, like us to discuss and got some good submissions. And Tyler is going to be the man on the hook for this first question because he was the only person from Inside the Hall that actually watched the games in the Bahamas. He was down there uh, in August, watched Indiana play two exhibition games against BC Mega. And and first question, Tyler, what are you focused on in terms of these opening games for Indiana uh, to see in terms of improvement from what you saw down in the Bahamas? I'll reiterate some of the stuff that I said earlier, just um, from my thoughts of watching them in, in the Bahamas. But I mean, I just thought that Given how much time Mike Woodson had been working with them, given how much time they've been together as a team, they they just overall look really good in the Bahamas. They they look like kind of the opposite of what we saw last year. They had a ton of energy, a lot of poise. They were picking up the loose balls. They were making making um, just the kind of the 50-50 plays that we didn't really see them make last year. Um, but the one thing that I, I think does stick out to me kind of moving forward and, and is definitely something that fans are probably hopeful for um, is, is seeing the offense get into gear. Um, they, I mean, Indiana shot, I think in, in one game, they shot 42% from the field in the other game, it was something like 33%. So they didn't, they weren't really efficient on the offensive end at all. Um, so I think seeing those shots go in it is going to take a lot of weight off of the shoulders of everyone, not only everyone watching, but everyone on the floor. And, and the thing to me, why, maybe those shooting percentages weren't as concerning to me in the Bahamas was because it, they passed the eye test in terms of what the offense looked like. It, there was a ton of movement. There was a lot of good looks. Um, it, it, there, there was just continuous motion screens, um, kind of everything that Mike Woodson had envisioned the offense and as talked about the offense being, it looked like that. So it wasn't like Indiana was shooting this, you know, not great percentage without even starting the offense with like 10 seconds left on the shot clock, which is something that we saw last season. So to me, I wasn't extremely concerned about that because there was just good offensive flow. But I think seeing some of those shots go and knocking down some of those looks that they're able to create, I think that's probably one of the biggest steps for me, especially because Mike Woodson has said that the offense has been behind the defense um, so far in their kind of development um, because he's put a lot of emphasis on the defense. So seeing that offense, uh, kind of come around in the, in the outside shooting. Yeah, and I think just naturally we may see better percentages in these first two games because of the competition level that Indiana is going to play. I, I can't speak necessarily to what how good of a team BC Mega was, but they have obviously a player who could be picked in the in the draft next summer. He didn't play particularly well down in the Bahamas, but 
they also have some grown men on that team, so the physicality may be a little bit different than what we're going to see against these early games against Eastern Michigan and Northern Illinois. You mentioned the defense being ahead of the offense. Um, that was kind of one of the questions uh, in general that we got um, in over in the community just about the defense in general. What, what do you feel like the identity – for Indiana defensively is going to be because in the past with Archie Miller, it was this pack line defense. It was a very structured system. You know, Mike Woodson's talked about in the preseason and since he uh, got hired, you know, the, you know, the first thing is just being able to stay in front of a ball handler and, and, you know, basic principles of defense. And, And it seems like that's something that they worked on a lot, but from an identity perspective, I mean, what are some of the things you'll be looking for these first couple of games to, to kind of measure progress for Indiana um, on that end of the court based on what you saw uh, in the Bahamas. You mentioned the one thing which was staying in front of the ball, and, and that's something that Mike Woodson has emphasized a lot. In fact, they and in some of their early practices, he didn't allow them to switch on defense. He, he made to, to ensure that whoever's in front of the ball, look, you gotta, that's your responsibility. You have to take care of them. Um, so that you know, that's that's certainly something that uh, I would be watching for for in the first couple of games. Is can they just simply stay in front of their man? And I was actually watching highlights um, a day or two ago. Noah Farrakhan, who's on Eastern Michigan, obviously uh, Eastern Michigan, a team that Indiana should take care of. But Noah Farrakhan, um, he, he's a very elusive guard for them, a point guard, and um, he had 27 points against. I can't remember who they were playing, but he, I mean, he, he has that ability to take guys off the bounce. So to me, that's going to be like an early indication of can Rob Fennessy, can Xavier Johnson be a guy like, all right, let, let's, you know, here's a guy that can make some plays like that. Let's just simply stop him. Um, so for me, you know, that's something to watch for early on. And in terms of identity, I think it's like, I know this is kind of a cliche, but um, just like toughness and grit. Cause that's what I saw a lot of in the Bahamas that they, Indiana was just the tougher team. They they simply seemed to just want it more. They had more energy. And I think a guy to personify that was Parker Stewart. Um, he, he was a guy that was in passing lanes. Um, he, he was he he was just in the face of whoever he was guarding and making it making it tough. Um and, and he didn't play as well on the offensive end as uh I think others would have maybe liked in the Bahamas, but you know, he contributed uh, a lot on the defensive end. So I think just being a just being a team that is kind of gritty and, and is is making it tough on you know wh- whatever they whatever they the other team is trying to do um, just making it difficult in, in any situation. So I think that's probably to me that's probably the identity that Indiana needs to lean on. One of the things that's most intriguing to me early is just the point guard rotation because it's something we've talked about and we've written about and all off season with obviously Indiana bringing in Pittsburgh transfer Xavier Johnson returning Rob Fennessy, also returning Christian Lander. I can't think of a season in recent memory where on paper Indiana has three guys who legitimately could play significant minutes at point guard. And and in my opinion, long-term potential, Christian Lander may have the most of any of those three guys. He's still only 19 years old. He's a five-star recruit, but last year we really saw nothing out of him in terms of his production on the court that indicates that he's ready to take a major step forward. What we saw in the Bahamas, I believe was Xavier Johnson starting. Is that kind of what you expect to see when the season tips off and how do you kind of see the hierarchy going? I mean, is it going to be a quick move, you know, maybe at the 13, 12 minute timeout where fantasy comes in and where do you feel like Christian Lander is going to fit into the mix? It's it's an interesting storyline to me because a lot of the offseason, Mike Woodson has spoken very highly of Rob Finnessy. He's he said he's seen more confidence out of him out of him. And Rob Finnessy has talked about it too. He started reading the uh intentional mindset by Dave Anderson. Uh he he meditates with the mindset or the calm app every day. So that's something that he has like consciously tried to get better with. Um, and there were certainly some moments in the Bahamas uh where he looked more like the freshman version of himself making plays that there was one I remember where he he had a steal went down the other way laid it in it was just it was kind of just a nice simple play that um, showed the impact that he can make but overall I wasn't like 
I wasn't extremely struck with what he did in the Bahamas. I don't, it, I wouldn't have watched him and been like, oh yeah, like Rob Finnessy is back. And, and obviously that's just a two game sample size. So, um, you know, I'm not going to put all the stock into that, but I think the most important thing, especially, I mean, for all three of them, but we didn't really see a whole lot of Christian Lander in the Bahamas was that just consistent efficiency because neither one of Finnessy or Xavier Johnson were, was really efficient in the Bahamas. Um, Xavier Johnson, the, the second game, I, I thought he looked really good um, distributing the ball, making plays off the bounce that Indiana really hasn't had the last couple of years. But he also shot four for 15. So he, he took maybe a, a one or two questionable shots. So I think for that group, it's just like, how efficient can they be? Because in all likelihood, you need like they're gonna need to spread the ball. Like it, it just it, it might not be necessarily them going out and scoring 15, 20, 25 points like like Trace can get, but can they spread the ball around without turnovers, without unforced errors? Um like just with the opportunities that they have, uh, making the best of them. So um for me, it's just how efficient can that can that group be? asking you to kind of look in your crystal ball here and predict what's going to happen here but do you foresee a situation where one of these guys separates themselves from the rest of the pack or do you see this as a situation where Mike Woodson's going to have to on a game to game basis see which guys got it going that night and kind of make an adjustment uh, you know that's not something that Archie Miller always kind of had the luxury of doing with depth in the past couple of years but with this particular situation it seems like he's going to have, you know, if Xavier Johnson comes out and turns the ball over in the, twice in the first four minutes, he's got two other guys he can turn to. Do you see any of these three guys being good enough to separate themselves from the rest of the pack, or do you kind of see it as a situation where we may have a platoon of, of maybe two or three guys for most of the season? I think the nice thing about the way that Indiana's schedule is set up is that in the non-conference game, Mike Woodson has the ability to – try different things. He, I don't think he needs to set in stone. Well, this guy is probably only going to play five minutes a game. He doesn't need to make that decision four games into the season. Cause um, you know, the really only challenges in Indiana's non-conference schedule should be Notre Dame, St. John, Syracuse, all of, all of the other games you would likely pencil in as wins. Um, so I, I think that that stretch of the non-conference games will be really big to see if someone can separate themselves. And I think right now, I think it would be Xavier Johnson just because he has that potential and that elusiveness that Indiana hasn't had the last couple of seasons. And uh, he, he just, he's a playmaker. He, he's a guy that can go out and, and you can hand him the ball if nothing else, and he can go make a play. And, and I do see the possibility of the, the lineup uh, shrinking in that rotation because in the Bahamas, Christian Lander, he played garbage time. Like he, he was in there when it didn't really matter. He he played probably single digit uh, minutes in the two combined games. So given that Mike Woodson would do that in an exhibition game, that doesn't mean anything over the summer. That's an indication to me that, it, Hey, if, if this guy is not producing, you know, as the big 10 season starts, he's not going to put him out there just for the heck of it. You know, like it, there's gotta be something that is being added to the team. Um, so to me, that's an indication of like, you know, if it comes to the point where one guy isn't producing, then he might, you know, uh, fall out of the rotation. Indiana fans who just listened to what you said about penciling and those wins are definitely have in the back of their minds Archie Miller's first season in Bloomington, which you weren't on campus then, but his first game as coach at Indiana, they hosted Indiana State and lost by uh, 21, I believe it was 90 to 69. And then they came back. Uh, won a game in the Crossroads Classic in Indianapolis. It was a pretty thrilling game. I think you know Jawan Morgan made some key plays late. They won, I think it was an overtime game. And then they come back at home again and lose to Fort Wayne. So nothing is a given, obviously, in college basketball, but I agree with you. I think most of these situations early in the season with Indiana's schedule should set them up nicely for wins. One of the questions I'm getting... Mo asked most frequently, and one of the questions I don't really feel all that equipped to answer, so we can talk about this as much as we can and kind of give people what we know, is the injury situation. What we know is Indiana was supposed to scrimmage at Hoosier Hysteria, and they didn't. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, but 
they cited that they were Mike Woodson basically said they were too banged up to have a scrimmage and, and they didn't move forward with that. Then they had a secret quote, whatever you want to call it, closed scrimmage, secret scrimmage scheduled against Cincinnati. That was canceled days before it was supposed to be played. We do know that they played against Belmont last Saturday uh, in Louisville at the KFC Yum Center, reportedly won by 11 points. Reports are that 11 guys played. So it sound like, sounds like most guys were available and able to play. The guy I'm being asked about the most is Michael Durr. Tyler, what do you know about just his availability, what it's been like? Obviously, he didn't play in the Bahamas. And are you, you know, we'll learn, I think, on Monday when Mike Woodson gives us a press conference. Actually, I'm sure somebody's going to ask him about the health of this team. But I'm operating on the assumption that it seems unlikely that Durr is going to be available to play because we, we haven't seen him play yet. But what are, what are you, what are your thoughts, I guess, entering the season on Indiana's health who who's going to be available and and how that could impact the rotation, particularly in the front court, if Durr's not available to play. Yeah, like you said, there's been no indication that he has played yet because I know uh, Logan Duncan didn't play in the Bahamas, but there have been some practice clips that IU posted where in scrimmages where he was participating. So, um, and I think he said at IU's media day too, he's he's full go in practice. So, uh, I'm not as concerned about uh, Duncan, but with Durr. To me, that's just a big question mark because it's been talked about a lot, and I do agree with it, um, that how much the loss of Joey Brunk hurt Indiana last season. And and Joey Brunk is not a guy that was going to go put up insane numbers. You know, he maybe put up six points and four boards a game, five boards a game. But his impact would be much more than that because he just adds so much depth as just another body to put in there. And we saw the toll that it took on race and trace last season trace had to play 34 minutes a game. I think he averaged. Um, and I'm sure race Thompson was around the same mark and, and he race Thompson, uh, fractured his nose. I think it was in like it, late in the season. Um, and then he played two games later or, or two days later, he played, he didn't even miss a game. He was playing with a mask on. Um, so in a big 10, that's just so physical, um, so physically taxing just to have another big guy that you can put in there and eat up minutes and get some rebounds, I think is huge. So that's why I think, you know, Michael Durr might not need to put up huge numbers, but just, just to have him on the court, just to have him um, eating up some minutes to be able to give guys a little bit of a break, because right now you have Logan Duncan back there too. And I feel like he's not as, he's not really as much established as Michael Durr. So you're not sure what you're going to get out of him, a, a freshman who's not as, either physically mature um, as probably any other, any of the other big guys on the roster. So uh, to me, that's a, you know, that's kind of a, a concern. Uh, my question too is uh, speaking of injuries, how's your ankle doing? My ankle is, well, it's my Achilles, but it's roughly 80% at the last uh, physical or at the last orthopedic checkup. So it's, it's rounding into form getting back to Durr here for a second. You made some really good points. I don't think it's a huge cause for concern if he's not available right now, but I think as the season moves along and you get into the big, the meat of the Big Ten schedule and you're going up against Hunter Dickinson and you're going up against Kofi Coburn, you're going up against Travion Williams, Zach Eady, and if Trace Jackson Davis and Race Thompson are going to be bearing the brunt of those matchups on a night-out in night out basis and not have Michael Durr out there to at least give you 10 to 15 minutes, people can say all they want that, well, Logan Duncan can play in- instead. Well, Logan Duncan is 18 years old right now. Michael Durr turns 23 in December. The difference between those two guys physically and from an experience standpoint is pretty substantial. So I think it's important that Durr get healthy, but I do think it's also important that at some point before Indiana gets into the tougher part of the schedule that he does get he- some chance to play and get used to it because it's not going to be a situation where you want to just throw him in there against Illinois for the first time, you know, of the season, because that's probably not going to go very well. So I, I really think, you know, he's pretty important just in terms of the depth of this team, because I I, I just Logan Duncan long-term, I think projects to be a really good college player, a really solid college player for your guy. That's going to give you production is going to give you some rebounding, some post-scoring, but for this particular season, 
I don't think you want to get into a situation where race Thompson and trace Jackson Davis are playing 32 to 34 minutes a game and going up against these physical guys in the post and having to be the only person out there that, that goes against them on a consistent basis. Anything to add on that, Tyler? No, uh, I'm just convinced that you keep pushing back the timeline of your Achilles because you're scared to play me in one-on-one. Well, I, I wouldn't even attempt that, man. I'm almost 40 years old. I'm not going to, I've seen your, I've seen your uh, videos on Twitter and I would be crossed over and then you would probably post the video. So why would I ever put myself in that situation? Let me ask you this. This is a question that, you know, I've had uh, kind of going throughout the off season. Who do you, th- who's like the biggest X factor for you on this Indiana team? Like if, 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 this player turns out to have a really good year, then you can see Indiana being a four or five seed in the tournament, or you could see Indiana being the fourth or fifth best player in the Big Ten. Who do you think that is? I mean, obviously, you can't say Trace Jackson Davis because he's not an X factor, but if I ask you to pinpoint one guy who kind of fits that criteria and you say, if this guy does this, then Indiana can be really good, who would that be and why? We were just talking earlier about Indiana needs another guy that it can rely on on a on a consistent basis. Someone that on a on a night in and night out basis that you know is gonna gonna produce. Because last season Indiana didn't really have that outside of Trace Jackson Davis. You can make the argument for Armand Franklin, um, but after his ankle injury mid season, it was kind of hit and miss just because he wasn't um, totally one hundred percent healthy. It seemed. Um, I, I would say there's a couple guys that I would put as candidates for this. I, I would say Miller, Cop, Parker, Stewart, um, and, and Xavier Johnson to a certain extent. Cause I think, like I was saying before, Xavier Johnson can just change the game with his, uh, his elusiveness, but I'll go with Miller cop just because he kind of fills the need of a lot of different things that Indiana wasn't able to do last season, uh, just in terms with his shooting. I mean, he's a guy that's six, seven, um, he, he can shoot the ball and, and he's a guy that if, you know, if he if he can make three threes, four threes get hot really quick. Um, that's something that Indiana didn't really have last season in terms of just the the ability to heat up really quickly um, and knock down outside shots. And, and I think that the answer for him is twofold as well because he is six seven, yet his rebounding numbers don't jump off the page at all. And that's something that he said Mike Woodson is really pushing to get out of him. Like, let, like, let's get on the boards. Let's not only make an impact on the offensive end, but l- let's get rebounds and, and let's be a stopper on defense. So I think that his, the way that he, he is made up in terms like f- his physical makeup, that his ceiling is hot. Like he hasn't reached his potential yet in terms of what he can be. So I think the first obvious thing for him is shooting. Um, but then if the defense and, and the boards can come along with it, which his physical attributes allow him to do, it's just a matter of him making it happen. Um, I think that can be huge. And then I, I also wrote about before just like his personality and his leadership. He's he just like a very, very interesting and unique guy. But he, he's a guy that has come in in just a few months, uh, been a voice that that guys really trust in the locker room and that that has experience. I mean, has experience playing in the Big Ten, which I think. Um, it is invaluable. So, um, yeah, I would say I would say Miller Cop as as my candidate. I'm going to go with Jordan Geronimo. He's still one of the youngest guys in the program. I, I looked this up yesterday. The four youngest guys on the roster: Logan Duncan, Tamar Bates, Christian Lander, and Jordan Geronimo. I felt like at times Archie Miller last season really mismanaged Jordan Geronimo in terms of how he used him. He plays that game at Iowa where he was complete, you know, he was a big reason that they won the game. And then he comes back the next home game. I forget who exactly they were playing against, but he barely played. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, you have this young player who goes in, helps you go into Iowa City and not an easy place to win, guards Luca Garza for large portions of the game, gets some confidence. Everyone's talking about him on social media. He feels good. He's like, wow, I'm I'm finally here to make an impact. Then you turn that you turn around and you don't even barely play in the next game. I just didn't really understand why they did that. And I'm looking at him like in terms of raw talent and potential on this team, he he's near the top of the list for me because I think his athleticism is you know, as much as it's talked about, I think it it's it can get to another level. I think he's a little maybe a little bit underrated with that. I think he has a chance to be a really good rebounder. I think 
just watching his shot on film from high school, I think he, if he gets the confidence, he gets his feet set, he gets in the right position, he's going to be a guy that's going to be able to go out there and knock down the occasional three-pointer for you. And at that size, I think that's really valuable. So I like Jordan Geronimo a lot. I don't know that if the breakout comes this season or if it comes maybe you know, next season or, or in the years to come, but I, I'm looking at him as kind of like maybe not the same impact as a Jawan Morgan or an OG Andanobi had early in their Indiana careers, but I think there's potential there for him to have a similar impact on this team. Going off what you were saying about the way that his minutes were managed, I, I would make a case for probably three, four, or maybe three, all of the, that freshman class last season, I felt like they were held back by just the way that they were used because it seemed like every single week on, on Archie Miller's radio show, he was saying like, you know, we're going to need Christian Lander this week. I told him like, he, you know, we're going to need him. We're going to need him a lot. And then he would go out and play maybe like four to five minutes a game. And there's just, I, I know that you might not want to throw him into the fire in the big 10, but it's like, there's no other way for, for you to learn. And there was times last season where I felt like Christian Lander, I think it was in the Iowa game too. He didn't have the numbers that Jordan Geronimo did, but he came in and he played a couple really good stretches of basketball where he just he did he didn't make any mistakes, which was a step forward from what he was doing earlier in the year. But then he'd go back the next game and he wouldn't play. So like I think the same can be said for Anthony Leal, where he made three threes against Wisconsin was a was a spark. But, you know, he's almost the reason that they won that game. And then there's just no consistency. And it's it's almost impossible, especially when you're a freshman, especially in a COVID year, to get in a rhythm when you you play well and then the next game you just you don't see the floor. And to a certain extent, I think that's what happened with Trey Galloway too. Um, he did have that back issue, but he moved into the starting lineup earlier in the year. Then he had the injury, moved out, and I don't even think he played in the game against Rutgers in the Big Ten tournament. He he maybe played a couple minutes. I don't remember him playing at all. So when you're talking about like growth and development, to me, that, that stuck out from last season of something that stunted how they were developing just because as a player mentally, they didn't know when they were going to get in or like there was no, there was no consistency. So, um, you know, I, I'm interested to see how that freshman class progresses this season because two of them put their names in the portal. They could have left. They both decided to come back. The other two guys are Indiana guys through and through. Who didn't? Who committed immediately after? Even after Archie Miller was fired, saying that they're going to stay at Indiana. But this was a class I was like looked at as having a lot of promise and showed flashes of it last season, but nothing really on a consistent basis. So I'm, I'm just interested to see how kind of those four guys pan out uh, for Indiana this season. A couple more questions here from the community before we we go for this episode and get ready for next week's season opener. It feels good to say that, but. Tyler, what in your mind are are the type of teams that will give Indiana matchup struggles this season? And and before you answer this, I think we talked a little bit about this earlier. I think it could be teams with a lot of front court size if Durr isn't able to play because if if your primary defender of bigs in the Big Ten at all times is going to be Trace and Race, I think that's going to put a lot of wear and tear on their bodies, but we talked about this a little bit before we started recording and you had uh, maybe a different viewpoint. Um, what kind of team do you think necess- could uh, present some problems uh, in D- for Indiana uh, from a defensive standpoint? Yeah, I agree with your perspective on it, but I'd also add to that um, just the teams with dynamic ball handlers, because th- th- we talked about it earlier about Indiana's in like trying to, get like con- make it concrete that they can stay in front of whoever they're guarding. And that was something last year that that was a real issue, whether it was against Michigan state and Aaron Henry continuously carved them up, whether it was against Rutgers and Geo Baker was doing it. Um, to me, that's, that's kind of it, it, the dynamic ball handler is something that I, I really want to see how Indiana handles because when you look like a guy like Andre Curbelo, that is extremely creative with what he can do. Geo Baker's back in the Big Ten. Um, that's where, when we've talked about what are we going to see out of the point guards, that's a huge that's a huge issue because we saw how that can lead to breakdowns last season. One guy gets beat and, and the, the the entire defense just kind of collapses because then you have 
kick out option. Then that's when they start hitting threes and that's when everything starts to get starts to get rolling for the other team. So to me is that if there's a dynamic ball handler, um, can you stay in front of them and can you make them uncomfortable in the Bahamas? I think Indiana did a really good job of doing that. Um, and, and I'm interested to see, especially in the big 10 where you have a lot of guys that are extremely talented with the ball. Um, can, can they replicate that? Three guys that you didn't even mention, and they're not necessarily point guards, all of them at least. Jaden Ivey at Purdue, he's going to have the ball in his hands in the perimeter. He's going to have a chance to – he's a potential lottery pick. You know, he, He's going to attack in a variety of ways, but that's the kind of guy you got to have uh, maybe not Rob Finnessy or Xavier Johnson on, but you got to have somebody that can stay in front of a guy like that because he's capable of going at you all night and getting 20. Two other guys, Devontae Jones at Michigan, comes over from Coastal Carolina. I think he was the – player of the year in the Sun Belt last year. Another guy that pr- probably should make a pretty big impact for them. And Tyson Walker up at Michigan State. Comes in from Northeastern. I think averaged 18, 19 points a game. He's another guy. So as much as we kind of talked about this being the year of the big in the Big Ten, there are going to be some nights where there's going to be on the other team a guy that can go from the perimeter and get you 15, 20, 25 points. And Indiana's going to be... Uh, gonna have to stop that. So I agree with with that. Last question, and this is one that only you can answer because you're the only one on this podcast right now that's a current student at Indiana University. But I'll rephrase the question that we got submitted a little bit. Obviously, the football season, which you're covering for the Hoosier Network, has kind of uh, you know it started with all of this promise and all of this talk of you know is this a season where Indiana you know goes wins eight nine ten you know whatever we talked about in the preseason uh, it's obviously headed south fairly quickly and it doesn't seem like it, there's any chance of it getting back on track. I mean, I think the only thing that they could salvage at this point is beating Purdue and, and winning the bucket that might m- make people feel a little bit better. What's the vibe just in general on campus with how football has gone? And then what do you think the excitement level is for basketball starting back up? I would say this even even before football started taking a nosedive that there uh, there's a ton of excitement on campus about Indiana basketball. I think that last season it was difficult for me to gauge a little bit just because of the pandemic and students weren't kind of out and about as much but I think that the students felt ex- similar to everyone else, every, every other fan that was watching it, that there's it was just frustration after frustration after frustration. Um but I think that there, you know, the excitement is is taking a new level um, on campus. Um, I think, you know, I think it's it's very similar to how, like I was saying, like everyone else is feeling. But people are embracing Mike Woodson. They're they're embracing his personality. They're embracing um, the 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 team and and what they've shown so far. Um, but you know, I, yeah, I would just say, I, you know, I think overall, like it's people are very excited for Indiana basketball, probably more so than they have been um, over the past couple of years. And I think that's a testament to what Mike Woodson has done in trying to kind of change the culture, uh, bring, bring belief back, bring that excitement back. And we can, we can add to that too. Like, and I, I don't know if this would resonate as, as much with students, but the fact that he's brought Bob Knight back already before game one um, to a practice and that, he is really what he set out to do from the day he was hired is make it one big family is unite the young generation and, and the generation that has been around for a little bit longer um, that, that watch Bob Knight coach. Um, But I think we are seeing, we're already seeing that kind of come to fruition and, um, and something else that stuck out to me in, in terms of Bob Knight was that, they did a post for his birthday where like some of the players were wishing him happy birthday. And I can't remember that happening before I correct me if I'm wrong with that, but that doesn't seem like something Indiana had done in the past. So I think that that just the the idea of bringing when everyone to all the generations together, like I think that's also playing a big role um, into the excitement because as a student, uh, you know, the students didn't watch Mike Woodson play live. At least they may have watched highlights, but um, the fact that they're already embracing him is just shows how much his personality and the way that he has presented himself um, has just resonated with everybody. He's on Twitter at Tyler underscore T15. Follow him there. He will be at Assembly Hall for 
most every game this season for Inside the Hall. Grace Ibarra will also uh, be covering the team uh, for Inside the Hall this season, and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be interesting to see. I think you know we may not learn a whole lot these first couple months. You know, obviously there's there's some marquee games sprinkled in there, but probably gonna be a lot of lopsided wins in Assembly Hall. But at least basketball is back. We'll have coverage of everything as usual on on Inside the Hall and, and podcast on the brink. Obviously, we've switched now to a more regular schedule with weekly episodes. So we'll be back again next week, everybody, with another episode of Podcast on the Brink.